When you do cross validation in the unscrambler, you can choose different ways of segmenting your samples through the cross validation. And I will explain what that means. To the right you see um, different versions of the data. Each row is a sample. When I do cross validation, I fit models several times. The first segment, I take only the white part of the data. I take those samples to fit a calibration model and I leave out the first sample. Then I predict that sample with the model I build. The next segment, I leave out the next sample, etc. So if I have 10 samples, I will get 10 segments when I leave out one sample at a time. This is called leave one out cross-validation. That's a very common approach, especially if you have few samples. But it might not always be the optimal way to do cross-validation. There's a more advanced version where you can decide how to select the samples and how to leave out several samples at a time. And we can call that leave one group out cross-validation. What is it we are doing when we do cross-validation? Well, we are simulating that we have new samples. Imagine that we have a data set where six different labs have performed the analysis. So we have data from six different labs, several samples from each of the labs. Now we want to build a calibration model. And maybe we want to show that this model will also work when I get data from a new lab that was not included in the calibration, I can test that with cross-validation. Because I can do cross-validation in such a way that I leave out all the samples from lab 1, then I build a calibration model and I fit the data of lab 1. Then I leave out all the samples of lab 2, make a model and fit those. The errors that I get from that will reflect how well I predict data from a new lab. So I can use my cross-validation for verifying exactly that I'm able to predict data from new labs. The situation could be the opposite. The situation could be that I was only interested in predicting samples from exactly these six laboratories. Then I would not do my cross-validation as I just said. Then I would make sure that in every segment I took out samples such a, that all six labs were still represented in my calibration data. So you see, this is interesting because you could get two different results, even with the same data set and even with the same purpose of making a calibration model, but depending on whether you want to do a model that works for new labs or only for these six labs, you will end up with a different number of components and therefore different uh, predictions. When you have all six labs included, then you would imagine that you could take out more components because you know exactly what labs you are using. So any significant systematic variation from those labs can be included in the model. But in the other situation where you want to predict samples from labs you don't know, then you don't have that information available and likely you will end up with fewer components and maybe worse predictions, but those are the predictions that you can expect when you predict new samples from new labs. I hope the principle here is clear. It's not something that you have to think about deeply every time you do a calibration model. But in the end, when you end up with a model that you really want to test, then you can use similar thoughts to make a cross-validation that show you exactly what you're interested in by considering that cross-validation is trying to simulate new samples and by you defining that new samples uh, would mean something specifically, samples from new labs or new raw material, etc. In many cases where we're doing initial exploratory uh, models where we're not aiming at the final model, we make less effort in making uh, the cross-validation the exact right one. We are more focused on other aspects of the modeling, such as outlier detection and similar things. This plot shows you what cross-validation looks like in the unscrambler. To the right, you see that we have chosen to do PLS. It says PLS 1 
in the top part of uh, the menu because we have only one Y variable. Shown in the plot is also the validation in the middle where we have chosen cross validation and if we choose setup we get the menu shown to the left where we can choose between different kinds of cross validation. Full cross validation meaning leave one out one sample at a time random segments or we can define different kinds of systematic uh, segments if we like. So there are many possible ways to do the cross validation. But remember it's not the primary uh, issue to look into in detail, especially in the beginning parts of an analysis. And quite often if you have few samples, for example less than 20 or 30, you have to do leave one leave one out cross validation because you have too few samples to really define a lot of advanced uh, segments. And then we come to outlier control. The PLS model consists of a model similar to PCA of X of Y and then a relation between X and Y which is called the inner relation, the scores in X and the scores in Y. These are three different models essentially and we can use each of them for detecting outliers. And remember, as always, outliers ha have to be considered carefully before they are removed. You cannot just remove an outlier because it doesn't look nice in a plot. You can remove an outlier because you have shown that it was a mistake, a mistaken sample somehow. But if you cannot show that, then it's a sample that you would also expect in the future and therefore you have to accept that you will have samples like that also in the future. Here the different models in the PL submodels in a PLS regression model are shown. The model of X scores times loadings, the model of Y scores times loadings, and the inner relation relating the scores in X with the scores in Y for same component number. So score 1 in X to score 1 in Y, etc. And each of these we can use. Uh, the, the X and the Y part are used exactly as in PCA. So we won't go into detail with those. The inner relation can be used for checking for linearity and for outliers. Here we see a plot of scores in X and scores in Y for component 1, 2, 3 and 4. The first thing to note is that there is a very nice linear relationship in component 1 but we also have an outlier there. One sample which is notably away from all the other ones and clearly there must be something wrong with this, with this sample. It's not wrong with respect to X because its score values are not extreme in X and also not in extreme in Y but it's the relation between those. So that could be for example a labeling mistake. The Y values are right but they don't f uh, they are not from that sample for example. As we proceed to component 2, 3 and 4 you see that the linear relationship becomes worse and worse that's very common, even though sometimes you also have uh, initial components with little linear relationship. That could be because uh, of a lot of significant variation in the data that's not related to your property of interest. If you look at component 4, there's basically no more relationship between the T and U scores. And probably the same can be said for component 3, whereas for component three, uh, 2, there might be uh, some though not very uh, significant um, l um, relation between the T and U scores. So maybe component 2 can be useful for predicting, but the validation result will show us that. As for PCA, we can do influence plots, and these can be helpful for detecting outliers. The influence plot plots the residual variance versus the leverage. Residual variance of a sample tells us whether that sample has been described well by the model. The leverage tells us how extreme the sample is within the model. And what we see typically is, as shown in the plot uh, lower right, 
that a sample at some component number here, component number one, has a very high residual variance as sample number 101. That means that when we extract the first component, then what remains to be described is mainly sample 101 because the other samples have been well described. And therefore component number 2 will focus on describing sample 101 and therefore in the two component model this sample will go to the leverage uh, direction to the right in the plot. And that's typical for an outlier. Also remember when Unscrambler makes a PLS model it will give you an influence plot. But that influence plot will be based on the number of components that Unscrambler decides is right. And that is not right. You have to decide the number of components. And in any case, you will often like to see the influence plot for the first components because these are the most important ones. And that's where you primarily, or at least initially, want to focus your attention when you look for outliers. So redo the plot before you look into it.